building off that, how do you feel your degree from Mizzou prepared you for your work? Well, I was already doing the work before I even really started, right. so it was really good preparation. I mean, I wouldn't have gotten the job with the star if I hadn't worked for the Missourian. And I wouldn't have gotten, I mean, I went from the I went from Mizzou to the, the San Jose Mercury News, and um, I wouldn't have gotten that job had I not had clips from from the, the Missourian and the star. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I think it was a perfect preparation, really. Um, what advice would you want to give to the aspiring journalists at Mizzou today? <laughs> uh, I think, you know, what's different now, I think, is that you, it's helpful to have more, um, to be more multi multifaceted, right? To be able to write, to be able to do broadcasting, to be able to, you know, to, to work on the web. Um, and I think, the, you know, to be able to, to, to take photographs, you know, this is all stuff that was like, was and in many ways still is a complete mystery to me. You know, <laughs> all, all I could do is write. And so, uh, but I think, you know, where it's going, I mean, I, I'm actually personally very optimistic about the business. I, I, I mean, I know that it's, I'm not optimistic about newspapers because newspapers are clearly, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if they're dying, but they're clearly being overtaken by other mediums, you know. But I think the, the, that in many ways the, the journalism part is the same. It's, it's about gathering information. It's about telling good stories. It's about informing people. It's about, you know, getting information that people need. And I think that's always going to exist. The demand for, I, I mean, to me, the demand, what's happening with the mediums is that the demand for information is actually expanding, that somehow the supply of information is influencing the demand, and so there's more of it. And um, so I think people want information, it's just about how to deliver it. Right. And um, so the more ways you can do that, I think the better situated you're going to be. And um, so it's hard to specialize like the way I did. Okay, well, that's all I have for you right now. I think um, my partner has a couple little more intense <laughs> questions for you. Yeah, so I gotta research this. get ready. Okay, okay. Um, I was just I was looking at just like the work, the extensive work you did in the Middle East, and um, have you had the opportunity to work with journalists in the Middle East? And what was, and if so, what was that like? I mean, language barrier wise, or just environment and culture wise? Well, with the journalists, I mean, the Post has um, you know an extent extensive network of reporters and translators who. Mm -hmm who are on the ground. I mean, it was a little bit different for me because when I first started going to Iraq, I was covering the U.S. military. Right. So I didn't really, you know, I was embedded generally and I wasn't spending, you know, I, I was, so I was talking, you know, I didn't need language right. okay. skills because I was, yeah. you know, everybody I was, I was interviewing spoke English. Uh -huh. um, most people I was interviewing spoke English. Uh -huh. And then when I would be out, you know, I would have some kind of interpreter that the army would be providing, okay. but it was problematic. I mean. That was problematic. It was uh -huh. difficult in that respect. I mean, for a lot of different way, reasons. Uh -huh. But um, but that said, we when I did, you know, transition into different into different types of stories, you know, we rely on those people heavily, mm -hmm. you know, and um, and really all you can do is you know is admire the, the, the incredible courage that that these people have. I mean, we the Washington Post lost a. Um, uh, you know, a reporter. You know, last October, yeah. I, I was in Baghdad when it happened, and it was, you know, it was, it was, it was devastating. I mean, you know, this was a, a reporter who, who everybody knew and, and loved, and and um, had contributed to you know innumerable stories that had been you know on the front page of the paper, and um, you know he went out and he was just doing his job one day and was killed. So, you know, it, it, it it's really, I mean, and I, I still even now. I think it's it's one of the most um, underreported aspects of the war is, you know, there, I think at this point, you know, well over a hundred Iraqi journalists have been killed, and so you know the, the sacrifice these people make, it's just uh, it's just incredible. Wow, <laughs> um, and just well going off of that, what um, as more of like a personal question, what impact does it have on you traveling so much and um, being embedded with the troops and having to delve into these issues that have been have gone unnoticed for so long up until when all these you know books on Blackwater started coming out like Jeremy Scahill and that kind right. of thing um, well 
by the time I started reporting on private security, um, there had been, I think, you know, it's interesting because I think with, with, with regard to private security, my impression was always that the, like the academic world and, and, and the less mainstream media was ahead of the mainstream media uh-huh. on, on, on the issue. Yeah. You know, you know, people like, like Jeremy and, uh-huh. and, and Robert Young Pelton and um, Deborah Avon and Peter Singer. I mean, those people were well into the research, you know, long before the sort of Blackwater thing became a, you know, became a real issue, mm-hmm. um, you know, before Nice or Square. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think, you know, personally, I think Iraq generally, it, 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 it inevitably takes a toll on, on everybody who, you know, who tries to cover it. Um, for some reasons that are, are more obvious than others, you know, I mean, I just spent an, I, I spent an inordinate amount of time away from my family. Mm-hmm. And I was in a situation that was obviously more dangerous than, you know, a kind of a normal assignment. And so that created more stress on my family. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, and that really, it really does, I think it, for everyone, you know, it, it, it takes its toll. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think also it's, it's, it's incredibly meaningful work. You feel like it's really meaningful work because it's, I think you're, I think more so than any time in my career, I just felt like I was, you know, I got into the business, you know, idealizing people like, you know, Bob Woodward who, you know, provided, you know, information that the country really needed. Yeah. And I think more so than any time in my career, I felt like I was in that position where, you know, for better or worse, I was the one who was, um, you know, who was gathering the information and putting it out there. And I, and I felt like that it was, you know, it was our, our country's war and, and that it was important, it was important work. So, um, you know, there's a lot of trade-offs. I think there's a lot of trade-offs that go, or go you know, that go with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also, I was listening some, to some interviews on NPR that you had, um, and just based on um, like the State Department and the I think it was the Coalition Provision Authority that were that's like overseeing the regulations of um, of right. these private military contractors. What do you see the future of that? Um, what do you see in the future of that? Do you think what? How do you think the regulations will pan out for these contractors? You know, I think it's a really it's a really hard question to to answer um, because I've always felt that. I mean, there's two issues. One, one is that it's true the regulations have always been murky about whether, um, whether about whether private security contractors fall under, you know, do they fall under civilian law? Do they fall under military law? You know, are should their immunity be protected? Um, all those issues I think are valid. But to me, one of the key issues was even if you had those provisions in place, even if it, there was clarity surrounding the regulations. Mm-hmm. Who is going to enforce them? You know, who who is actually going to prosecute? You know, uh, somebody who, you know, is involved in a questionable shooting in the in the middle of Baghdad. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the military has involved in its own issues, and um, you know, and I think we're going to find out to a large extent um, with the re- resolution of the Blackwater case with Nisra mm-hmm. Square. Right. You know, because you you know we we've heard that there have been. Um, you know, possible indictments coming down, and mm-hmm. and um, you know, it's going to be if they do, it's going to be. I think it's going to be difficult to to prosecute those cases. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a shooting that you know that took the lives of 17 Iraqis in the middle of, you know, in the middle of a war. Mm-hmm. Um, the, obviously, the there are a number of questions surrounding the way the shooting took place. But right. you know, the question is, how do you not only investigate that, but if you indict, how do you prosecute? How do you get witnesses? Mm-hmm. You know, how do you get witness testimony? Um, is that testimony uh, useful and valid? Right. Um, you know, it seemed to take some time for people to even get to the crime scene. What happened to the crime scene by the time they got there? You know, mm-hmm. in the interim period, um, and then who's going to prosecute them? You know, like the way the the provisions, as I understand them, mm-hmm. they're it's the it's the prosecutor in each in the jurisdiction of the the residency of the of the accused who's responsible for prosecuting the case so say you had six guys who were prosecuting who were being prosecuted out of blackwater i think 
as my understanding, those guys would have to be prosecuted in six different locations. Right. So I, I just I think it's going to be really interesting to see how it shakes down. But it's a long answer to your question to say I don't know yeah. really. A um, couple of final questions for you. Um, first one being, did you actually set out to win the Pulitzer with this story, or <laughs> was it just you know luck and skill and kind of a blessing? Oh uh, well, I mean. I think somebody said it today. I, like the idea that you could set out to win the Pulitzer Prize, it's like, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't even know how you would start, really, you know. But, but I do think that um, it is aspirational more than anything, you know. It's like you think, well, you know, what would it be like to win the Pulitzer Prize, you know? But I don't think you ever really think it could happen to, you, or at least I didn't think it could ever happen to me. Mm -hmm. um, I think more than anything, it's. It's about, um, I, I don't know, it's, it's about doing the work, really, you know. It's, it's about setting out to do the stories. And, um, you know, really, what, like when I, when I set out with this thing, it was originally just going to be one story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had an idea to look into, you know, private security and, uh, you know, and, and try to figure out what that was. I was just going to go do one story, mm -hmm. and then um, you know it ultimately it became a bunch of stories. Right. So um, I don't know how I can't remember how you put it, but <laughs> it it was more like a you know it was a combination of a lot of different things. You know I think a lot of it too is sort of the altitude of the story because you know I think if I had done these stories all year and Blackwater you know the Blackwater had, incident had not happened in September. Um, I mean, that created a whole new line of stories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it also was sort of an event that crystallized for everyone sort of that this was a, it was an important issue in the war. Mm -hmm. And we were already on it. We were, just because we had started working it, you know, we were ahead of everybody. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think that, I think that helps. So it's luck. I mean, I would never say that it's luck that some 17 people got killed, you know, in a Baghdad traffic circle. but. I just don't know whether the, I don't think that the story would have had the same resonance, you know, the same resonance if, if, mm -hmm. if, if that event had not, had not happened. Do you know where you're going to keep your Pulitzer Prize? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like a, I, I don't even know what, it, you know, what they, I don't even, I don't even know what it is every year, but they <laughs> give you a, well, you get a check, you know, and then you, um, and they give you like sort of a, a glass, I wouldn't even call it like a, it's, it's an oversized, I don't know what you'd call it, like, it's not a paperweight per <laughs> se, but it's a statuette, and I don't know, it's sitting on my desk now, so. Oh, well, congratulations on that, that I mean, I really, really honestly enjoyed reading your um, series on, thanks. on the contractors, that was fantastic. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> All right.